<laughs> All right, so welcome. Wait, what? I have images of them. What does that mean? I have pictures of them doodling. Oh my okay, that is a perfect segue into oscillatory motion. Here we go. <laughs> last day in this year. That's right, chapter 12, last one we're going to be covering. So let's take a look. Even though that's not how the book works, but I, I guess that's it. Well, that's the end of AP Physics C. The book, um, <laughs> the book goes through... Um, AP Physics 109 and 110. Uh, so the second half of the book would be a second semester class. Like, what's the name? The name of the physics test you'll be taking? Yeah. It would be AP Physics C Mechanics. Yep. What's the other? Electricity and magnetism. That's a whole other beast. <laughs> so let's take a look at the question. We'll get through the notes and day one. So we've got this crate here, and the crate is stretched to an amplitude A. And after the person lets it go, it oscillates back and forth in one full oscillation. How far does it go? Does it go A over 2, A, 2A, or 4A? It goes A, 2A, 4A, 4A. Okay, I heard 4A more than any other answer, and that's good because it's the correct one. Because when you let it go, and it goes from A to the equilibrium point, that is A. That is the amplitude, 1A. Then it's going to oscillate back here and slow down, that's another A. And then it's going to come back here, that's the third A. And finally come all the way back to 4A. So, that's what's happening there. 4A is the answer. What are we trying to let go? Your notes will be titled. <laughs> right. No, I don't. Okay. I'll have to think about that harder. Okay. Okay. I did not. Oscillatory motion is what you title your notes. Oscillatory motion. I won't do cursive as much as I want to. Yeah, that was awesome. Well done. I'll do cursive underneath it. I can't help myself. Awesome. Guys, I think I got the lowest score. I got 20 out of 30. That's okay. Half dies. There we go. Keep going. Keep going until after class. Have you ever seen him like sign his name? My writing is half cursive, half not. I what letter and what letters to write. That's not a good way to <laughs> right. When I, wait, no, when I was in third grade, we were halfway le through learning cursive, and then they just stopped teaching us. They said that we didn't even know it anymore. Yeah, it's been changing. Most people don't know it now, I don't think. Well, I you know still it. have to know it how to like do chart. Right, like I, I can like, write some really cursive if I want to. Don't. Sure. But like, you, they yeah, stopped teaching us. They, they were just like, yeah, they just changed the rule yesterday, and we don't need to do it anymore. They just stopped teaching us the new rule. Hmm. Yeah, Interesting. <laughs> I actually I prefer writing in cursive. I go a lot faster that way than regular writing. So I don't pick up my pencil when I write. I was required to write in cursive. You can't read in cursive from sixth grade to eighth grade. Well, that will come in. That will come in handy when you get to college. You gotta write down notes a lot. Exactly. So Fs. That's the force of spring or the spring force. That's going to be equal to negative kx. K is a constant. And your constant K is going to be basically how strong your spring is. It's in newtons per meter. We'll get more into that later. Yes, usually. Yep, yep, this is regular. X is the distance from your equilibrium point. If you're stretched like a maximum distance, then it would be, you know, like an amplitude 
uh, but x is just your overall distance from the zero point where that spring would be naturally if you just let it let it be. And this negative is here because when we're dealing with springs, that spring force is always opposite the direction of the spring's displacement. If the zero point is here and you're stretching it to the left, yeah, your left is over here, um, then the force is going to be to the right. So because they're always in opposition, your spring force will always be a negative value. A couple other things you need to write down. you're watching at home, you might want to pause it right here. Oh. Too late. You failed. I'm just really glad that you upload yours to um, YouTube because Mr. Mason doesn't, so when you have to like fast forward or forward or backwards, his like pauses, oh. like you have to restart where yours you can see. What does he upload it to? Oh, straight from screencast to school. I, no, just, no, just from like the team's recording. Okay. I, I guess you can do just that. Just download the video Wait, and put really it up on your own. You can download from Teams and you, you can just watch it on your own. It's so annoying. Setting it. it's just, you can just download it from Teams and watch it on your own. You have to watch the recording. But yeah, but you really can't. Angular. Yeah, it's basically um, a new way to say angular velocity is also angular frequency because they're both dependent on the amount of revolutions per second. So, yeah, angular frequency is equal to several things, this being one of them. I'll point out some of the others. Um, it's on your formula sheet, actually. It's equal to four different equations. <laughs> so, yes. What's yes. Equilibrium? equilibrium would be the spot where that spring lands if it's just sitting at rest. So it's just like the balance point. So like the starting yep, the point. balance point. So if you were to let it oscillate back and forth and finally it comes to a stop, the place it comes to a stop would be the equilibrium point. Yep. That's just the force that's trying to get the spring back to the equilibrium position. Spring constant K is usually going to be a value that's given to you in newtons per meter. Uh, when it isn't, it can be found this way by taking angular velocity or angular frequency, whatever you want to call it, multiplied by the mass, and that's going to be squared. Uh, displacement X, that's just how far you are away from the zero point, the balance point. M is equal to mass. Angular frequency is equal to this, along with three other things that you can find on your formula sheet in the oscillatory motion box. So feel free to take a look at that. Angular frequency is a big thing in this chapter. You're going to be able to solve for it in many different ways and use those answers to come up with other answers for other parts of problems. So. Next up, go ahead and draw this in your notes. We're going to talk a little bit about what that represents. 
Well, it's a cosine wave. It's, it's a kind of a cosine wave, but it's pushed out to the right a little bit. And we're going to talk about how to take that into consideration on this part. So on this diagram, there are a couple things that we need to make sure we're very well aware of here. So this right here would be the distance that this is kind of off. You know, cosine functions start at the maximum height, your maximum distance there, just like sine functions start at zero. But this is offset a little bit. And the way that you can compensate for that, the way that you can account for it, is using something known as a phase constant. And we use the Greek letter phi to denote that phase constant. What do you suppose we call this? It's a certain maximum height there. That is a crest, and we call it an amplitude. Yep, that's what we're going to label it as. So that would be your amplitude A. It kind of is. It kind of is, yep. But now we have to take you know, these phases into account and a few other nasty little things. Yeah. So if the maximum is here and it takes this long, because this is time on the bottom here, it takes this long to get back to that same height, what would we call that amount of time? Yes, that's a period. If we were measuring, if this was distance, yes, we would call that a wavelength, absolutely. Uh, but here we're going to call it period because it is a time. A <laughs> couple other things we need to point out about this. The wave function that describes this kind of behavior goes a little something like this. And here's where this relatively simple wave turns into AP physics. <laughs> yeah. So that's the function that this represents. This would be your angular frequency, how long it, um, how long it takes to do a full revolution there per second. You've got Amplitude A, time is T, and this would be your phase constant. We're going to go through some examples with this, and it'll become perfectly clear. So just to make sure everybody is on board, write down that A is equal to amplitude. And omega is equal to angular frequency. It has the exact same units as angular velocity. It's radians per second. And that phi, again, is our phase constant. It's the difference between the actual full-on cosine function and how much offset it is. Questions on any of this? Everybody still on board? All right. We'll ride this wave together. Oh, and T equals time, by the way. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Green sounds like a good choice.
Uh, no, it's still the fairy, I think. But it was. Katie have a very good one on I know. I looked over and saw lots of colors. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll wait a little bit to change it. I don't think the fairy has fulfilled her duties as physics mascot just yet. But yes. <laughs> okay. So, one thing I want to make sure we're aware of is this. Oh, right. no. Yes. You don't need to draw this. No. You're welcome. Thank you. But let me just explain a little bit. So, we're going to be relating position, velocity, and acceleration, not just with, like, derivatives and integrals and all that, like from regular part of physics. Now we're doing it with waves. Whoa. Yay! Did we say that? <laughs> okay, so I have a quick question. I know how to do this. Okay. Because I know how to do this. Okay, so on the top blue one, you know how the dotted line doesn't, in the middle, doesn't go all the way through? Why does it go all the way through and the red one on the bottom? You mean, why is it coming out a little bit here? No, no, no the, the center line. It's so unimportant. Why are you... I, what? What? Never mind. I am lost. No, I'm curious. I got you. <laughs> oh, I Give see. me the black marker. As she erases the whole thing. No, actually, here. I can just... I can just she just wants you to do this. Oh, I get it. Because it's inconsistent. Yeah, symmetry is fun. Okay. So if this is our position... I'm sorry. I just had to know if there was an important... <laughs> There was there was no importance, but okay. I'm glad we got that taken care of. It was probably driving the folks at home insane. So this is our position time graph, and uh, you know you can think of this like being stretched from the equilibrium point. So right here you're at a maximum value on the positive side. Here you're at a maximum value on the negative side. Here the object would be passing through the zero point. Now if this thing is oscillating back and forth like that then at this zero point, it's going to be traveling its fastest at that location. So, because when you release it, it's going to pick up speed, pick up speed, go through the zero point, and then start to slow down as it gets further the other way. So that's why at this zero point, you've got a maximum velocity there. And at the zero point here, there's a maximum velocity right there. Uh, in terms of the acceleration, the acceleration will always have its maximum and minimum values when the distance has its maximum or minimum values, as you can see there. But they're offset. And the reason that they're offset is because if you have uh, your distance on the positive side here, what direction do you suppose the force is? In that direction or the opposite direction? The opposite, yeah. Because if, if this is, we'll say the positive direction is to the right. If the positive direction is to the right, then at that point when it's all the way to the right, the spring is trying to yank it to the left. So because the force is to the left, that means the acceleration is to the left as well because they're proportional to each other. Uh, so yeah, that's how this works. Questions on that? This is just kind of a passing thing. Okay. Let's get into how we're actually going to apply all this stuff. Do we need to draw No. <laughs> That's okay. So x equals again amplitude times the cosine of omega t plus b. Eventually, you're going to hear this stuff and see it in your dreams. So you'll be using it that much. So this is our equation. If we want to make this into a velocity equation, what do you suppose we got to do with it? Derivative. we got to take the derivative. At least I didn't start with the acceleration and make us integrate, right? Right. Yeah. Plus c. <laughs> Plus c. <laughs> OK. So for the velocity, first thing we're going to do is use a different color. What color is good for velocity? Red. I don't think we I don't did. Think we, I think we pulled up the board. Yeah. Okay. So we'll use green for velocity. If we are going to figure out what this is in terms of a velocity, we need to take the derivative of it. So if I'm taking the derivative of this of x with respect to time, then let's see here. The derivative of this whole thing 
This is going to be a chain rule problem. So what that means is we got to take the derivative of the outer no. and then multiply it by the derivative of the inner. Yes, absolutely. What is not a constant? Uh, the only th everything is a constant except for t. So that actually makes this a little bit easier. Now the outer function is cosine. So what's that going to change to? Negative, negative sign. Very good. So it's going to change to negative, negative a times the sine of the inner function. And what's the derivative of the inner function? T. t. Well, I mean, if we take it with respect to t, there'll be something else left. Like if you take the derivative of 3x, what would be left from that? The 3 would be left, the constant. Like if, if I'm taking the derivative of omega t with respect to t, oh, the t would drop off. So yeah, so it's times omega. In other words, negative omega a sine oh, that wasi. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Wasin. So that would be, um, yeah, you can just... Yeah, you can just multiply it by w at the end here, or just rewrite it. It's not too long. Acceleration. I think red is a good acceleration color. You get acceleration by taking the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So, if all of this stuff is constant except for t, we're going to get kind of the same thing. Uh, what's the derivative of negative sine? Negative, negative, negative cosine. Negative cosine, yep. Uh, so now, if you're going to do this and you want to keep it on the same line, leave some room the over the here. No, we're doing the derivative again. No, if you go from negative sine, then you go to negative cosine. Oh, yeah. Then I'm after that. Sign. Is this Yes. I'm going to show a few more steps, but you're right on the money. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's going to be, we, we're going to keep this outside the same, just for now, except for changing this to cosine. And then we've got our inner function plus phi. And once again, we have the same inner function. So the derivative of that is omega. So that omega comes out here, making this negative omega squared times a times cosine times what's plus phi. What's the plus phi? Precisely. <laughs> Questions on how this works? I know what you did, but... I Now, the question might be, what is the maximum velocity that you can get out of this? And it's quite simply, you know, what's the maximum value that sine of anything can be? One. So your, yep, your maximum velocity is going to be plus or minus omega a. On the same note, your maximum acceleration is going to be plus or minus omega squared a. And that's kind of the foundation for what we're going to be doing here. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> okay. to keep going. So this is our function. This describes our object's position as it oscillates back and forth on some spring-related system. So 
I want to define a few things from this. What do you suppose my amplitude is equal to? Four. Four. And if it doesn't give you any units, just assume it's meters. In terms of our angular frequency, what's that? Five. Hey, all right. And that would be in radians per second. What about our frequency? This one's a little bit more tricky. So when we're talking about frequency, um, our angular velocity is equal to 2 pi times our frequency. And remember, frequency is how many cycles per second are happening. So if I want to solve for frequency, frequency is just going to be your angular frequency divided by 2 pi. Therefore, henceforth, yes, frequency is going to be equal to pi divided by 2 pi. Because that divided by 2 pi. In other words, half of a hertz. Isn't that one half pi or mm. no. Anybody remember how to get the period of an object? Uh, uh, yes. And re with respect to frequency? T. T equals so frequency. Period is equal to the inverse of frequency. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Two seconds. Very good. Oh, whoa, whoa. Uh, I feel like I was taking out of context a little bit. <laughs> yeah, say you're surprised. I dare you. <laughs> okay. So, um, we got to make sure we're familiar with how to calculate all these things. Uh, and this part should be pretty straightforward. Now, let's say we want to figure out what our velocity is. Well, we can use the exact same equations that we used in the last example in order to figure that out. So remember that velocity of an object is just going to be equal to negative omega a times the sine of omega t plus v. So keeping that in mind, I think that was like a pole or something. So if I want to solve for my velocity then my omega, like I saw here and there, is pi. My amplitude is 4. And then I've got the sine function. Again, omega is pi. T is t. And then, as far as our phase constant goes, um, pi over 4. Yep, that's good. Because this, your your velocity is going to change based on the time. You know, as time goes on, the object is oscillating back and forth with different positions, velocities, and accelerations. So if you wanted to clean this up, which I think I'll do, you'd probably want to put the 4 out in front. Yeah, that's all I'm going to do. So yeah. I have to clean that one up. So and of course, because it's a velocity, your units would be meters per second on the end there. What's that, Potter? So the 4 can be anyway, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, you, I mean, it can't be to the right of the sign, but anywhere to the left, yeah. So if I wanted to then solve for acceleration, remember the main change we make here is that the omega is squared, the sine changes to cosine, and then we go forth from there. And we have kind of a similar looking thing. Mm -hmm. So we would then have 60, negative 4. No, because A is not squared, just the, just the omega. So pi squared. Oh, just the pi. Yep. Very good. Thanks, Scott. I know the formula. Otherwise, I'll be. We're finding the derivative. Hi, Kylie. Questions on this? 
said in some like special severe concussion that probably won't heal until August. What? Five hours. Fell me on the ice. ice. <laughs> yeah, she slipped on the ice and like smacked the back of her. Oh, that's the back. Yeah, that's back. <laughs> What's the laughing for you, Dad? The phrasing button. Oh, okay. The intentional phrasing button. Well, yeah, but I think it's even funnier that you waited that long to say it again. (laughs) Yeah. All right, last one we're going to do today. We're going to say this object has 900 grams for mass. Spring constant K is a lowly 3. This is pretty small for a constant. And our amplitude is 50 centimeters. You can kind of see why I'm using these numbers. Generally, we want mass in kilograms and amplitude in meters. So we have to make sure that when we do see something other than that, that we convert pretty much right off the bat. Okay. So if I want to solve for my period T, how long it takes for this object to go back and forth one full time, there's a couple different ways that you can do that. On your formula sheet, in regular physics, in simple harmonic motion, you can see the main equation for this. Um, 2 pi times the square root of m over k. So if you wanted to use this in order to solve for the period, you would just plug those numbers in. But again, you do want to make sure that you're careful by putting in the SI units. This needs to be in kilograms, this needs to be in meters. Then you'll have a wrong answer. So that's what we would have for this one. And out would pop your period, which would be equal to 3.44 under these conditions. Okay, we're almost there, folks. So then maybe it asks for the maximum. Let's use a different color. Sounds good. Maximum velocity. Again, the equation for maximum velocity is plus or minus angular frequency times amplitude. So it's just a matter of plugging in those numbers there. So we have our amplitude, that is 50 centimeters, which is 0.5 meters. And in order to solve for our angular frequency, um, there is a relationship that I, I showed you before. Angular, yeah, equals 2 pi f. And so you can use this in order to, in order to figure out what's going on with your your angular frequency because remember frequency is the same thing as 1 over t therefore angular velocity or angular uh, frequency is equal to 2 pi divided by your period t which we calculated right there there are alternative ways to figure this out just like in most of the other things we do in this class I'm just going to use this way for this example. Um, But there are other ways that you could figure it out because if you remember on this whiteboard, the very bottom gives you another equation for angular frequency. Again, these are all listed on your formula sheet. So make sure that you don't lose it. Okay. So if I wanted to run this calculation... My angular velocity would end up being equal to 1.83, and that would be in radians per second. My amplitude again, 0.5, and that's in meters, giving me a maximum velocity of 0.913. So that would be your maximum velocity. If you want to find your maximum acceleration, you can probably figure it out for yourself. We'll go through it anyway. So maximum acceleration is equal to plus or minus 
omega squared A. So you've got omega, you've got A. All you got to do is square that, multiply it by 0.5, and out pops your answer. 1.67. So that's what those would be equal to. Finally, what do we got? Two minutes to go? Yeah. Yeah, a minute and a half. Okay. The last thing is I just want to make sure that you're comfortable putting this information into those equations. So if I was going to put this information into the x equation, it would be the amplitude which is 0 0.5 times the cosine of the angular frequency, which would be 1.83 times time plus a phase constant. If it doesn't give you one, you can assume it's zero. For the velocity, uh, so this one's going to be um, omega. I suppose it's going to be negative now. So negative 1.83 times the amplitude, which is 0.5, and you can multiply that together later. Sine of 1.83 T plus V. That's fun to say. <laughs> and you kind of get the idea. Did I make any mistakes there? Okay. Did you make any it's a day's mistake? work right there. <laughs> I'm sure I'll find out on the video later. Uh, but yeah, the purpose of today is just to kind of give you a taste of this um, and to refresh your memory on those derivatives when you're going from position to velocity to acceleration. If you can understand that, the rest of this is just busy work making sure that you have your equations down which you'll figure out as you practice these problems. So, more to come tomorrow. On, yes, it is. And honestly, this is probably the most abstract stuff in this chapter. Everything from here on out is a little bit more down to earth than this. I know this is kind of out there. Just, just a little bit. Oh, good. I'm glad you don't think so. <laughs>